that man was systematically murdered in front of everybody. There is nowhere in the law enforcement community, law enforcement profession, where that would ever be, those tactics would ever be justified it for any reason in that particular instance. I love law enforcement. So as much as people crap on the profession, we need it. If you haven't been in law enforcement or a firefighter or to a certain extent in the military, people don't really understand what it's like to run towards danger when everybody is running the opposite direction. Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Today's episode is with my friend, Maurice Philogene, and he is just incredible. In addition to being a real estate investor, he's an executive, he's a restaurant owner, He's a law enforcement officer and a world traveler. He and I invested together with a group in some apartments up in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's how I had the pleasure of meeting him. And he flattered me by listening to this show as he was working the night shift as a police officer in Maryland. So his journey is so interesting and he has built a series of micro empires and he's sharing that with others now. So I hope you really enjoy this. Keep the feedback coming. I love to hear from you. To be honest, Jennifer, the this real estate stuff has never been the goal for me. Like it's um, I don't it, real estate is just one thing that fuels my life. My life is this map behind me. My life is I'm working on spending time. I'm working on putting half of my life in the Mediterranean now. I I have a business partner in Cyprus. We're buying stuff together. But that's not what, like doing land deals. That's not because I want to be in real estate. That's because I always wanted to live in the med, but I want to be a part of the community. I don't want to be a visitor. I want to be the guy that's, oh, that's Maurice. He built that over there and he's doing good stuff for the community. Like it, I have this thing about like plugging. I mean, we could talk about this on part, but I have this thing of plugging into the world. And that's what real estate is helping me do because it gets me out there and all that type of stuff. But It's just such a small dimension of what is going on, which is what I think is happening with a lot of real estate investors. They're not real estate investors. They have a ton of other stuff going on in their lives and people just kind of pigeonhole them into this box of all you do is real estate, which is just not true. Yeah, I love that. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, Maurice Philogene. It's so good to see you. (laughs) Working hard on that pronouncing that last name. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Also known as Mo. For sure. For sure. And I'm so happy that you're here. And I will let the listeners know that you and I met because we are both investors. We're in the same project in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I Mm -hmm. fortunately had the pleasure to meet you for a hot minute up in Knoxville. A few months ago. Wow. Yep. July, I think it was. July already. Yeah. What was that, right? No. So that's amazing. There's so many things about you that are amazing. You've been on a lot of shows. Yeah. And I'm going to run through, I'm probably not going to get everything, but you're a real estate investor. Mm -hmm. You're also a corporate executive in the healthcare world. You're also involved in restaurants. You're also a world traveler. And you're also a police officer. What have I forgotten? I'm a dad, first and foremost. I just retired out of the military after 22 years as a federal agent and lieutenant colonel. That's the other thing you were. Uh And I am a rabid football fan. Ooh. There you go. Good to know. That's good to know. There you go. Yes. Well, I like to ask all of my guests because I think it's really important if we could start with how you grew up and what your money culture was growing up inside your home. So how, how that was in your formative years up to about, you know, 18 when most of us get out of the house and then that changes and how that affected your work ethic and your relationship with money while you were growing up. Yeah. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. That blueprint was formed by the fact that I am an immigrant kid. My family is from Haiti. My mother was born in the capital, Port-au-Prince. My dad was born in the north of the country in port au prince which is a very, port au is a very poor place. So think, you know, tough clothing, no doors, no shoes. If, if you're lucky, you have shoes, that type of growing up. My mother was in a better, better situation, but I was born along with my brother in New York. And then my family moved us to Boston. 
where I call home effectively. I was there from six to 18. And then I came to DC for University of Virginia. So I've always had this city life thing going on, New York, Boston, DC. But given that I do come from an immigrant family, and I'm just kind of making a, a blanket stereotype, but education has really pushed hard, really, really hard. And it was in my, in my house. By the time I got to junior high, my father saw the writing on the wall that I was going to make the mistakes and probably end up in jail and locked up and all that type of stuff. And they moved me and my brother out to the suburbs and put me in private school. But he always said, listen, my job is to get you an education. And then once I get you that, the education and give you the tools to be out in the world, it's up to you. So in my home, everything from a money perspective was work, work, work. It was W-2. It was collect your paycheck, pay the bills, save what is left over, if there was anything left over. There was never any talk of, and I don't think my dad, even to this day, he just didn't understand. What he rested his hat on, along with my mom, was pensions. Because my dad is a 30-year educator for the Boston school system and retired as a principal, which is admirable. And he had his, his pension to ride on. And then my mom was let go out of corporate America back in the 80s, Bank, Bank of Boston, I'll never forget. And she ended up being a guidance counselor and went the same route as my dad. So they, they had that system, right? Collect money from, from your paycheck, pay all the bills, take care of the kids, put a little bit aside, make sure we have a house. And that was pretty much it. That's how I, that's how I grew up. That was what my blueprint was. Get an education and just put money in the bank somewhere. Right. So it's so interesting. I've had the folks that I've had on the show who've come from immigrant families definitely share the importance of education. Yeah. Typically their parent, they are first generation in, the, in this country, education and work, 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 work. Yeah. And there's a real <laughs> thread of entrepreneurs coming out of that. Yeah. It also, there's not in your case, but same like single mother households was a real thread that I'm seeing over and over again. And a lot of my guests were unwed teenage mothers Mm -hmm. who have, you know, overcome these odds and accomplished amazing things. So you leave home Mm -hmm. and we we now have the Boston connection. I was raised in and around (laughs) that area as well. You leave home, you go off to Virginia to go to school. Walk us through that and then kind of how you get started. Because at some point you make a shift because really what you've done and what you continue to do is you are methodically designing the life. I mean, you have the life, I think, that you want to live right now. I do. And everything that you do, you've always talked about it, whether it was the military, the police, or your day job, you know, in real estate, you love it. It's not like any of those things you're doing and you're saying, and I really hate this thing that I do. Yeah, yeah. But to me, it looks like you're still working on designing the second half of your life. But you're, ha- you're spot on. You're spot on. Yeah. So what happened? You head off to school. What do you study? Where do you yeah. go first? So and that's the thing. My school, Thayer Academy, and I'm, I'm very grateful that they did it because it just forced me to, I hated that school. Where, wait, where did you go? I think I missed it. Thayer Academy. Oh, okay. Thayer Academy. That's what I was talking to Stu about because a bunch of hockey players came out of Thayer Academy. Yeah, I hated it, but I respect it because Mm -hmm. it was so much work. It prepared me for what ended up happening in college. So I have to give kudos to them, although it's a love hate. (laughs) It's a love hate relationship. I got accepted into the Naval Academy, so so that was big. That was my mom's way of, or my parents' way of. Okay, we've got you the education now. It's up to you. And I told them I didn't want to go. And my parents are pretty good about stuff like that, so they said fine, you can go where you'd like, but you're going to have to find a way to pay for it because we already found a way to pay for it by getting getting you into the Naval Academy. So I found an ROTC scholarship at the University of Virginia where I wanted to go because I had done a business program in high school there. I wanted to play Division I football, which Naval Academy is, but I, I wanted the big school and all the hoorah and all that. So I ended up at UVA and I did mechanical engineering, not because I wanted to, but because if you put me in sociology, Anything where I have to write and think like that, I wouldn't make it. Numbers is what I wanted to do. So I did, Jennifer, mechanical engineering, Air Force ROTC, and varsity football all together for four years. And it was insane wow. while holding a job. That experience was crazy. That, it, was, it was absolutely nuts, but I was prepared for it because of all the education I'd had before and because of the impetus my parents put on me that we've given you all the tools, now it's up to you. Because I I called them the summer between freshman and sophomore year, and I had a money problem. And my mom 
she picked up the phone. Hey, baby, what, what's happening? This is all in Haitian Creole. Baby, what's happening? And I said, Mama, I don't have money and I need to do whatever it was. And she said, Baby, I don't, I don't have any money to give you. I need you uh -huh. to solve it. And from that day, everything changed where I figured out my own financial issues and all that type of stuff. So that's kind of how the schoolwork went. And then the journey that you know about started when I left college, got hired by my consulting firm, went down to combat training for the, for, the, for the military, and maybe three years later, picked up a personal finance book, and then everything totally changed, and my journey started. Do you remember what that book was? Oh, yeah. I was 21 years old in New York City with my then girlfriend who lived in Queens, and I stopped into a store that was kind of half bookstore, half convenience store. Yeah. And there was personal finance for dummies sitting in this bin for $3 <laughs> and change. And I picked it up. That's it. Uh, <laughs> that was the only thing. That was the only thing. And they, they, they said in there, listen, if you pay off your credit cards, you've made a return on your investment because you're now getting a 15% return where you could be paying them 15% interest. And then they had this one measly chapter on financial freedom. And then I was stuck on how to get it because I didn't want to stay in the nine to five forever. Yeah. So what is your, so at this point you're in the military, you end up being in the military career man. Mm -hmm. So we've got that going on. Not like mm -hmm. that's not a full-time thing, but yeah. I come from a military <clears throat> family. So I know that you, one doesn't typically get wealthy just on no. a military income, no. but what did you start to do? You have a corporate job as well, consulting. Yep. Yep. What levers do you start to pull at that point? You know what I did? I had the option in 1997 when I graduated of going guard or reserve or going active duty. There were too many officers coming out, coming out nationwide. Mm -hmm. I took the reserve option or actually the national guard option because my consulting firm, Accenture, I think my starting salary was like 40 grand. And at the time, second lieutenants in the military were getting paid 24 grand. So right. it wasn't a hard, hard decision at all. Right. But what I loved about being in consulting is that I knew that if you worked for a client for six months and you didn't like that client, you would move, you can easily move on and go to another one. So you know what I started feeling back then, which is part of the five freedoms that I talk about today? I started feeling the geographic freedom. Because I could work in California, then I could work in DC, I could go down to Miami, I could go over to Europe and work. I made the conscious decision to go that mo mobile route within the firm and stay a reservist on the military side so, such that I could have a lot of options. And that gave me the ability to start my investing career at the same time because of fluid and so mobile. That's great. Tell us about the five freedoms and when that yeah. <laughs> started to solidify in your head. It did. So here, I have this fundamental belief. I have a business coach, Trevor McGregor. He articulated this for me this year, but I knew this already because of the way that I had been structuring my life over the last 20 years. But that there are five freedoms, and if we can have one or more of them, people tend to shift towards happiness. Financial freedom, that's a bit, that's obvious. But then there's time freedom, because if we assume we're going to live to 79 and we only have 28,000 days to live, and when I see my life in days, I act. Mm -hmm. Because years is an abstract thing. So you have financial freedom, time freedom, geographic freedom, the ability to be, live, or work anywhere you want in the world at any particular time. And then the two that really have kicked in recently is freedom of purpose and freedom of relationships. Mm. And I, I like constant growth. And by going after those five particular things, it just seems like everything has fallen into place for how I wanted my life to be designed. So yeah, that's what those five freedoms are. So what was your first, so you've discovered the idea of financial freedom. You're already yeah. working two jobs that are, yeah. that are yeah. really, I mean, the guard, it, it, it is, a, it was, a, it was a smart choice because it's the most freedom that you can have in the military yeah. Yeah. and still continue to go on up. You're working for a center. You have the freedom to not stay with anybody for more than six months, which is great. What else clicks in for you? Well, it, 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 was, it was that. It was, okay, I started traveling when I was 15, and that's a unique story, but it has led me to almost 100 countries now. And when I, that first trip, when I went to Paris for 30 days and traveled with a family around the country in an old Range Rover, I realized that there was this big world out there that you could learn from, be immersed in culture, be immersed in languages, different food, different people, different socioeconomic issues, and 
I was kind of aware as a 15 year old, I didn't want to sit on a stoop in Boston drinking forties and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to meet people when, if you, if you couple that personal finance for freedom, personal finance for dummies book with a bunch of other financial books I picked up, I started investing in real estate in 2002. Mm -hmm. It was my first place. It was at the beginning of the boom. Three months later, the place with the fl same floor plan next door closed for 30 grand more. It's like, what does that mean? And then I figured out I made 30 grand. I went to a library, read 10 books in a day, nine or 10 books in a day, and I was off to the races. And what I figured out was, oh my God, I can do that financial freedom thing they talked about in that book by buying real estate and then paying that real estate off. And then I would create all these flows of income. So what I did was I, and this is where when I, you know, I heard your podcast, the, the concept of micro empires, I didn't realize I was doing that. But what I did was I bought, I got to the point where I had 35 places, but I systematically paid them, paid them off. And like if place number 25 appreciated in value, I sold it, I took the money and I paid off place number two. Right. And any revenue I got, military, Accenture, tax returns, a birthday gift, grandma gave me a hundred dollars. I would just pay off these properties constantly to the point where in 2014, I had 18 paid off places. And that was the freedom that was, I had a, a post-it on my wall and I remember crossing off the last step of, dude, you've, you've gotten the freedom that you were, you were working for. And it took me 14 years and I don't care that it took that long. It said I stayed consistent and systematic and I was like, oh my God, I have more income than I do from my regular job coming in from real estate. So those 14, which now had we'll say zero carrying costs. They always have some carrying yeah, costs, some. Yeah, of course, but yeah. you've paid off the mortgage. How much revenue was, were they generating? That's a good, Yeah. It was somewhere around 160. 160. 160 okay. Yeah. And it then of course th there's costs and it, right. So at that moment you could have left to the two everything. jobs. Yes. You could have left everything and just go on from there, but you don't No. I know there's restaurants, but at what point do you become a police officer? That's a good question. <laughs> You know what it was? So on the military side, when I, I left the guard after four years, I wasn't growing. I got recruited into something called Air Force OSI, Office of Special Investigations. So it's effectively like NCIS, but in the Air Force, if okay. you know the NCIS TV show. So it's yeah. the FBI equivalent in the Air Force. So I was an OSI federal agent for 16 years. I did a search warrant with a local police agency in DC in 2004 or five. And I saw, as part of that investigation, how much we impacted that family and what those local cops were doing. And I was like, man, I think I kind of want to be part of my local community and impact people like that. Because when you're a federal agent doing the stuff that I was doing, running field offices around the world and what have you, you're doing very high level government relation, government liaison, white collar, federal level crime. You're not usually getting involved in people's day to day issues. But local cops do, and they can impact people's lives in a significant way. So in 2008, I talked to my boss at my consulting firm. We, we made a plan. I became a cop without leaving my consulting work. And to this day, I'm still doing the job, although I split the, a position with another full-time officer. So I'm only doing two days a week at the moment, but I'm not ready to give it up because it's my, it is a very unique way to impact your community with a significant amount of authority, assuming it's used the right way. But I don't have to be a police officer, but I like, I like the ability to meaningfully impact the community around me. And that was just one way that I chose to do it. So where are you located? Where are you, where are you a cop, I should say? I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Maryland, so Southern Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you decide to become a police officer, what, what kind of training did that require? I had, every, I had to go to academy, full-time full mm -hmm. academy for six months. Train on the road with a senior officer for another three months, I think it was. So it was about nine months of training. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I had already had a law enforcement background because of the federal agent work, but street level work is totally different, totally different. Right. And it's way more impactful from my perspective. I think this is so interesting when you and I first met. I, I, find, I find this to be the most interesting thing about you. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of things that are interesting about you, so I hope you're not offended by that. No, no, not at all. But I think that many people could have gone into that experience that you had in 2004, 2005, a search warrant, mm -hmm. and have been gone in the other direction, were, what's the word I, I want to say, were taken aback by 
you're impacting, you're right. You have the most impact. You're going into people's homes. You're seeing them firsthand. Yeah. It's the microcosm of life. Mm-hmm. And a lot of folks would be like, this is way too much information for me. I don't want to see how people live. I don't want to see how people hurt each other or, you know, or how they're suffering, et cetera. You had the opposite feeling. And you've been a police officer now for, do the math for me. 12, 12 13 years. 12 years. years. Yeah. Okay. 12, 13 years. Yeah. And as, as a black man in the United States and as a police officer and everything else that you are, because there's also perceptions about police officers, like that's your only job. That's the only thing you've ever been trained in, which mm-hmm. is not true for you. Mm-hmm. What has it been like for you over this last year, your take on everything from George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, et cetera? How has that affected you personally and as a police officer? That's a, it's, that's definitely a loaded question that could never be answered in, in one sit down for sure. But the reality of it is I'm a black man first. I have been for 45 years. That's never going to change. I'm a father to two black kids. That's never going to change. I think when the George Floyd thing came about, that man was systematically murdered in front of everybody. There is no where in the law enforcement community, law enforcement profession, where that would ever be, those tactics would ever be justified it for any reason in that particular instance. I love law enforcement. So as much as people crap on the profession, we need it. If you haven't been in law enforcement or a firefighter or to a certain extent in the military, people don't really understand what it's like to run towards danger when everybody is running the opposite direction. And it's second nature to me now between my military career and being a police officer. But what I saw with the George Floyd thing, it just floored me personally, but I have a responsibility in my, in my own ecosystem, I have a responsibility to go out there and just do the job better and to make sure other officers are are doing it just as good. 99% of the people that I've worked with, phenomenal. Yeah. Rock stars care about the community. No one sees what happens at, I mean, I'm a midnight officer. So when we get burglary calls and we go into someone's house and we, there's a mom home with her two kids and husband is at work or on a business trip and we pull a burglar out of their house by the back of his shirt or something. Nobody ever sees that. Right. Nobody sees the car accident in the middle of the night where we help someone. No one sees the four-year-old boy, two, three or four-year-old boy, maybe about two weeks ago, who was found wandering on Georgia Avenue at four o'clock in the morning by himself. He just slipped out of the house. Oh my no, no, one, no one sees these things, right? What they right. see is what, what the media will put in front of them. So it's been a little bit tough because... There are so many good people doing this profession right. for the right reasons, and it's a thankless job now. The, yeah. the morale, I'm so sad to see what has happened to the morale and how many good men and women are just disappearing from the profession. And, you know, look what's happening in, uh, not to get all political, but where is it? Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. They pushed a lot of the good people out of the job because of all the scrutiny on it. And I understand the scrutiny, so don't, don't get me wrong there. I do. I want the people who don't, the people who should not be in this profession to get the F out, period. Yeah. But now the city is having to contract with outside departments because they don't have enough police in the city. Right. It's, it's, it's crazy. So it's been a little bit tough for me because you come home, you do the job, and then you turn on the news to catch what's going on day. And the first thing you hear about is bad police this, bad police that, bad. And you know that last night you saved two lives. You took three drunks off the road. You found a kid. I once carried a woman, maybe this was like six months ago, there was a fire in a high rise. I carried a woman down the steps, down seven flights of steps because she was in a wheelchair. So I just carried her down because wow. uh, there was a fire in the building. Wow. I like that ability to impact community. So when you ask me like, how has it been? Man, if people could just go on a ride along and understand what cops are, at, I don't like the word cops, what police officers are actually doing, they would get it a little bit more. And sometimes, you know how you see on the back of a police officer's vest, it says Mm -hmm. police or something. I wish instead of that, it would say community protector. There would be a different, instead of law enforcement, as if we are constantly like hammering down on people, how about the times that we block the intersection off because there's elementary kids, schools walking uh, across the intersection, we just shut it down because we want to make sure people get to school on time. Right. It's tough, Jennifer, but I wouldn't change it for the world. And I still, and you know, I don't have to be there. Right. I'm being part of the solution and there's tons of people like me. Right. 
Some people may think that podcasting is easy, but it's really not. It's all the back end stuff that someone like me doesn't know anything about that makes it very difficult to have a successful show. So, how have I been able to do it? By partnering with Streamline Podcasts. They have made my life so incredibly easy. I get to focus on my great guests and content, and then I deliver the audio to them and they take it from there. They do all of the editing, all the music, all the show notes, all the socials, and they just get to sit back and and within 48 hours, I have all of my content delivered back to me. The best part is they make it really, really affordable. And believe me, I've looked at a lot of different options. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to use this great product, you can contact Streamline Podcasts and use the code MICROEMPIRES, all capitals, all one word, and you will get a discount. Happy podcasting. Now let's get back to the show. I appreciate your service in the military as well as in the police. My experience with police departments, law enforcement, I've had experience with U.S. Marshals, FBI, et cetera, and uh, has always been positive. However, you know, I'm part of a group that we meet every other week, a group of diverse backgrounds to talk about, you know, racial change and justice, et cetera, and learning. And I recognize that my experiences come from a place of privilege, uh, you know, just being a white woman. And, but my overall experience has always been that law enforcement as a whole has provided a service. And I don't, I don't think that anybody goes into it thinking, I just want to go into this job so I can bully people and be an awful person because you would have to be doing a lot of really good small acts before you could get to that one time you get to be a real bully, awful person. I think, I think in general, people do the job for the right reasons. There are people who get into the profession just like any other. There are people who work at McDonald's who should never put on the hat. Right. There are bank tellers <laughs> who should not be working for Bank of America right now. Right. And there are, there are cops out there who shouldn't be police officers. Right. But like you said, a majority of the people are good. But I, I will say this one thing. People's impression of law enforcement or police are based on their personal experience with police. So if you've had a negative experience, I understand and respect that negative experience. I can't expect that person to feel comfortable with me, even though I you know I have integrity and I know that I would never hurt a fly unless it was justified, but they don't know me and right. they, they had a negative experience. So I respect that when, when people have a negative experience, I just suggest that in general, most of the people who do the work are doing it for the right reasons and want to be of service. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to walk down that because I really was curious and yeah. have, have, we haven't had a chance to really talk about it. And I, I just think, and I, I hope the influence is continuing to ripple throughout and that there is change where it, there needs to be change. But it's also still really interesting to me. And I wish there was a way to sort of blast it on you as you're going, like, you don't have to do this. You don't have to be a mm-hmm. police officer. This is actually a service for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. because it's not for the income or mm-hmm. the pension or anything else that's coming up. But let's talk, let's jump back a little bit about travel. Cause I remember you talking about that trip to Paris when you were yeah. 15, that kind of yes. woke up the bug in you. Mm-hmm. And I think anybody listening to the show, if I had to guess, I would say the majority of the listeners of the show have traveled or that's part of their dream because most folks who want financial freedom want to find time, want to find yeah. a way. They don't, they don't want to be strapped to two-week vacation in Florida and that's all they want. But tell me about, because you, you talked about this a lot and I know you speak more than one language, but <laughs> why travel is so important and how that has influenced you in building your micro empires as you're building them now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's incredibly important. It's probably the number one thing in my life and I'll mm-hmm. explain why. And that is, I don't mean that over my family, but I do mean it at the same level, but, and I'll explain why, but I just want to go back to the police thing. One, one second that goes yeah. back to the five freedoms, Jennifer, freedom of purpose. Like I, I have the freedom to go execute on things that mean something to me because of the micro empires, because I have structured my life in a certain way to be able to do it. So I just wanted to tie it back to that original, that original statement. That's great. But the travel thing, when I say that I've traveled to almost 100 countries, what I mean is not as a tourist. I, I don't do tourist stuff. There's nothing wrong with it, but I'm just expressing my own life. I have found a way. I mean, when I do it, 
or when I call out a country that I've been to, it's because I've spent at least two weeks of meaningful time in that country, either working, volunteering, or connecting with the local community one way or the other. So right. it's been it's been a lot. I found that listen, there's nothing tra- there's nothing wrong with traveling in the US, right? right? The US is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Mont I don't care where you go, Montana, Arizona, Boston, New York, Florida. Yeah. It's it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. The difference is when I go to Florida, it's still the same socioeconomic issues that we have in DC. We're still talking about politics, we're still talking about Trump and Biden and what's happening with Medicare and all like that. We're, that's what we're talking about. You go to someone else's home country, the socioeconomic issues are totally different. The cultural norms are totally different. Right. How you operate in that country is totally different. And it takes our adult brains back to the beginner's mindset where, man, I got to think through, how do I get a taxi here? Because I don't know the language. What do I do with the currency? I don't know what the banking system is like here. What's appropriate in terms of a greeting? If you're in the Mideast, do you shake hands or do you step back? Right. Uh, are you allowed to talk to a female or are you not? Is that seen as disrespectful? I love the fact that when you immerse yourself in culture, it puts us, especially as adults, back, in, back into learning mode. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Beautiful. And then the second part of it is we do have, to me, we have a problem in this country with consumerism and like oh my God, the amount of money that we spend on shit, just yeah. to be honest. Just to, you think? Just to, it's, it's, it's the American terrible. dream is bullshit. I say that it's all the time. Total, it's, it's total bullshit. bullshit. The, banks, the banks did it to make, to make money. But, but part of the reason why a lot of people don't have financial freedom, which is why I'm, I want to help people get their financial freedom, is because they are slaves to what they have bought. Or I don't want to say slaves, but they are, they are stuck working for their lifestyle. Right. Somebody went out and bought a house and then a vacation house and then two Mercedes. And now they have all these payments and now they got to go to work because they have to service these payments and all those types of things. Right. When you go to other countries, typically. Right. I mean, there's issues everywhere, but people are doing more of the work to live than the live to work mindset. And they don't need as many things as we seem to need here to be happy. Happiness tends to come from living every day, experiencing nature getting out in culture, all those types of things. So that first trip in 1990 created in me that has changed my life. And it's part of lifestyle design for me. I am constantly in some other country, probably once a month, once once every six weeks or so, doing something meaningful somewhere. And I don't think that that's ever going to stop. Right. And once COVID is over, we need to do that as a group yeah, or sure. at least uh, tag along. I agree. I think, so my desire for travel and how it changed my world growing up in New England, yeah, just outside of Boston. And then I graduated from high school early. I ended up driving across country with a girlfriend to live in California. We lived in our car for six weeks nice. and that's when I saw our country, but I saw, I knew what, I knew what poverty was in the city. I'm used to city poverty. Poverty in Appalachia or an Indian reservation, totally different. very different, very yeah. different. And I had never seen anything like that. I had never experienced anything like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you go to the middle of Arkansas from New Hampshire, if we were in Europe, that would have been six countries apart. So yes. it's a totally yeah. different culture, you know? Yeah. And I remember that was what woke up for me. I, all I knew was I wanted to travel. I wanted to experience other cultures and I wanted to speak languages. And yeah. I think the language thing I think is so important because we went to Mexico in October. We'll, we'll go again. We've gone a few times. And I told you this, like I have never, I, <laughs> I, speak, I speak Russian because I lived there for a while, but yeah. I don't speak it well. I speak like a child. And when I go, I think the beautiful thing is once you try to do it, then when you go to another country, like that barrier of, man, I'm going to look so stupid is gone. It's gone. It's totally gone. Right. Because I yeah. just stumble into it, smiling and asking and apologizing and trying to communicate. And most cultures are very, very friendly to that and, and just want you to do it. But I agree. It does bring you down to sort of the level of if you want a bus ticket or you want to buy some food you're going to have to figure out how to talk to somebody. You're going to have to do that. And then my definition of success when I spend time somewhere is 
you know, by, by the time I leave, do I know the la- local taxi cab driver or do I know that restaurant owner or the, you know, if I'm in an Airbnb or something, does the neighbor know me or whatever? Will someone be picking me up at the airport the next time I'm back in town? Like I am purposely trying to meaningfully connect with people no matter what I do. So I don't know. It, it has been, and that goes back to the freedoms again, geographic freedom. There are times when I'll pop over to like in, in 2019, I went to Finland five times and I would just leave here on a Wednesday night, arrive on a Thursday, say Thursday, Friday, Saturday, get back on a plane on Sunday and be back to work on Monday. You can do those things through travel hacking, right? which is, I've, it's a whole skill that I've developed over time. Right. I just, I, I love being a part of it just as much as I love serving my local community and being home. So it's definitely good. Well, as we wrap up, yeah. tell me, I mean, I know, but tell us what you're yeah. up to now and what, where people can reach you if you want folks to reach you, what you, cause I know you're, you're really trying to share this knowledge, not just with your sons yeah, and this yeah. mindset and other things. So kind of walk us through what you're doing now and where you're headed. Yeah. Thank you for that. So I am very heavy on, on articulating to people about these five freedoms and helping people figure out whatever the lifestyle is that they want, how to get it. Part of the way I'm doing that is through Quattro Capital. You know Quattro, but it's, it's, I'm one of the founding members of a real estate investment firm that was formed this past year. We purchase multifamily property. So let's say apartment buildings, mobile home parks, and then we work with investor partners to, to buy those properties. But what I love about it is if someone is an investor or someone's a principal, they are generating cash flow, which can then create over time, as long as you're consistent, financial freedom, time freedom, such that you can go do all the things that you, you want to do. So that is kind of what I'm working on now through Quattro Capital. And people can find that at the Quattro Way, W-A-Y.com. I love, love, love talking to people about real estate, but I even more so love talking to people about life. They can improve whatever it is that they want to do. So I'm frequently talking to people on Instagram. I'm, it's just Maurice Philogene is my handle on Instagram. I'm being a lot more bold about putting these topics out there nowadays. So folks can catch me there. And then the other place would be LinkedIn at Maurice Philogene as well. And here's the thing. I have never not returned anyone's message. I, I'm getting a lot of them nowadays, but I have never not returned anyone's message because you could say one thing or two things to someone that could send them on a whole different trajectory that could radically change themselves and their family's life. So I love talking about freedom topics. I love talking about real estate. I, there's a detective in my police department who's always wanted to invest. She needed help. Now I've helped her. She feels like she's on a path to financial freedom herself. I love being part of her journey because she wants to have legacy for her family and like break the cycle of what's happened in her family. So that's what I'm doing through real estate. I am working on all these freedoms and trying to get the message out there that life doesn't have to be just about the nine to five. And I think, I mean, I knew about all the things that you've done, but I don't know that it's readily obvious on social media, but I just think it's so interesting. Your background is such a myriad of things that, <laughs> you know, it, it, there, there's, there's lots of real estate experts out there. And all the t- I say this all, I'm not a real estate expert. I never plan yeah. to be one. I'm also, at, just so everyone knows, I'm an investor in uh, Quattro Capital as well. Not, I'm not a founder, but certainly we intend to invest as well. But, you know, when folks come to me and are saying, I'm ready, what do I do? I hand them over to the expert. But what I love about you and your journey is you've kind of never limited yourself. You know, it's not, oh, I'm going to be the corporate climb the ladder. Nope. Wait, I'm going to be in the military career. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to be a police officer. Oh, I'm going to own restaurants. Hang on. I'm just going to travel the world. (laughs) You just decided I'm going to do all of them and there's no reason not to do all of them. Because we can. That's very smart. Exactly. We we can. Freedom of purpose. And if you would allow me, I just want to say one more thing. Breaking the cycle. My family's an immigrant family. I wanted to do something big. I have a, there is a polar attraction for me in the Mediterranean region of the world. So I'm always there. I've always wanted to own property in that region of the world. And just by constantly falling forward or failing forward, I just kept seeking out, seeking out, seeking out people, making connections. And now I'm partnered with someone and we're doing a real estate development project on the island of Cyprus together. And the notion, the notion that this little inner city dude from Boston 
who I can still see myself, you know, drinking 40s on a stoop or whatever. I'm literally about to start a real estate development project on an island in the Mediterranean. I used to think it was an amazing thing. And then I started to realize I was always destined for it right. because I have been cracking at this stuff for so long. I, and I think people should think this way. No longer think that, wow, that's happening to me. You should be thinking about, wow, I expected that. So I totally expect to be doing those types of things and helping people. But right. that's the next step for me. So I just wanted to put that last chapter out there. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. It was great yeah. to see you. And I really appreciate you being on the show. I want to say one more thing. And I'm really touched by this. Yeah. When I finally got to meet you face to face and you told me, so you and I were an investor group together. Yeah. And so we'd see each other on calls but not knowing each other, somehow you came across the podcast. And I was honored to hear yeah. that while you were on patrol as a police officer, you were listening at two o'clock in the was. morning to my voice. Yeah. And when I met you, I was like, so you're the one, because I mean, this is early on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're the listener. <laughs> you're that guy. Right, right. But it, it was, your feedback was really important to me. And now I'm grateful. I'm, I'm finally getting, you know, lots of feedback, which is important. And that's exactly what I wanted this to do. And your story is so important to tell because you never came into an inheritance. You never <laughs> developed a widget that you sold for millions of dollars you know, you've just been chipping away at it and have made it happen. And the focus has never really been money. It's no. been about developing this life based around five freedoms. So yeah, I appreciate you being a listener and thank you for being on my show. Oh, you're welcome. And yeah, I definitely created micro empires over the years. So I'm glad I found you in your show. Thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. And if you enjoyed this episode, would you please go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review this show? If you subscribe, rate and review, it really helps me out a lot. And I so appreciate your feedback. I also will feature your feedback in an upcoming show. So I would love to hear from you on taking suggestions. And I really appreciate the feedback. Also, you can check out my website at micro-empires.com. I have a free ebook there that you can download, no charge, no strings attached. And it has a little workbook in it. If you want to do it online, I will respond back to you. You can also book time to talk with me and sign up for future courses and group coaching. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Have a great day. Stu, yeah. Mo's on the phone. He wants to say hi. Good. Maurice. I got to unplug oh, my... Maurice is on. <laughs> oh! That's my guy. Down. What's up, doing? man? How are you, brother? I'm great. How are you? I'm good, man. I was looking for you. I told I Jennifer. I didn't realize she was interviewing you today. Well, I have to tell yeah. you something. It was kind of like when my grandchildren call and they say, <laughs> where's Poppy? <laughs> where's Poppy? I did. I did. Right away. I was like, where's Stu? Where's, where's Stu? Poppy? I'm like, Stu hey, doesn't have that? to show. <laughs> do all the serious stuff with the redhead. I'm the fun guy. I'm there like, you uh, go. There you go. We'll goof off outside the show. Yeah. There you go.